Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to CHK Law. Welcome to our next Greater China Legal History uh, Seminar. We are very pleased to have with us today Professor Ryan Mitchell. Um, Professor Mitchell will talk about China's engagement with public international law in its historical context. Uh, I would like to give the floor to Professor Mitchell. Thank you very much. Come on. Okay. Um, so thank you so much to our dean for the introduction, um, and thank you to everyone for coming. Um, so <clears throat> this uh, subject of today's talk is uh, China's engagement with public international law in its historical context, um, and you might feel like you're get you're going to get rather more historical context than a discussion of China's current engagement with public international law. Um, there will be some of that, but a lot of uh, what I discuss will be focusing on the uh, background to China's uh, international uh, engagement, its participation in uh, the international legal system, and especially s kind of focusing in on some specific key episodes that uh, are somewhat under-discussed. Uh, some of them are uh, relatively well-known and will be familiar to uh, many of us, if not all of us. Others are uh, relatively not that well-known and will be uh, uh, sort of events uh, or, uh, or ideas that, uh, while they were important at specific periods in China's history, uh, over time have become gradually uh, forgotten or have had less attention paid to them. So just to reiterate a little bit uh, of a note uh, regarding the uh, source of some of this research, um, this is mostly comprised of material that is going into uh, the manuscript that I'm currently working on uh, for publication uh, on uh, the topic of China and international law. Um, and uh, some of it consists of uh, research that was conducted in uh, archives, including the uh, especially some really wonderful Taiwanese archives uh, of diplomatic uh, memoranda, uh, other sort of diplomatic historical materials uh, of uh, the Qing dynasty and uh, the Republic of China. So, um, and, then, and then of course other relevant historical sources, uh, which I think should be apparent. Yeah, so just to get started, um, the basic question of what it means uh, for a state to engage with public international law is one that is discussed sometimes by international law scholars and uh, sometimes and perhaps more often by international relations scholars as well as other types of political scientists, uh, by historians, um, but it, it is a topic that kind of branches across uh, multiple disciplines. Um, of course, uh, international relations uh, is uh, a field of study that is especially concerned with the degree to which different states play by the rules, the degree to which they engage with international norms and international institutions, and there are some specific uh, sets of relatively mainstream theories, mutually contrasting theories, uh, in IR scholarship especially, as well as uh, increasingly in international law scholarship itself um, regarding the, uh, the origins of states' uh, willingness to participate in international systems of rules. So uh, a couple of these different perspectives just to, as a preliminary before we get into China's specific example. Um, there are realist perspectives that emphasize the way in which states pursue their self-interest that they will only cooperate, they will only abide by international norms uh, and international legal structures when it is in their own state's self-interest. Uh, law is a tool to advance the interests of the state and it's, for the traditional realist, it's often not much more than that. Of course, later on there have been some more uh, sophisticated and more uh, uh, complicated visions of, of what self-interest is that take into account more of this kind of rule-following behavior. Um, there is another tradition of liberal uh, international relations theory, which has a lot to say about international law. And uh, this branch of uh, the discipline tends to think about uh, international legal behavior as stemming from the kind of state uh, 
that a particular country is, the kind of government structure that it has. And this uh, is especially expressed in the idea that as more states become internally liberal, as they become internally more uh, committed to the rule of law and to uh, participatory structures of government, elections, uh, freedom of expression, etc., they will uh, tend to also cooperate on the international level more and more often, right? That these are linked processes. Um, there's another school. Uh, it's often referred to as the English school. Uh, and this uh, is uh, basically stands for the position that the influence works the other way around. That there are, there's a community of countries, a community of states or nations. They have certain rules and customs. And when new states join that community, they get socialized into it, and they increasingly start to resemble the other members of the community, the other members of the club that they're joining in their own behavior. So a state that begins as uh, an isolated nation, as it becomes more and more part of the club of international law uh, or of the leading states, will increasingly resemble them in terms of their behavior, including following uh, international legal norms. Um, okay. Uh, just a couple more. Last, uh, secondly, uh, second to last rather, we have constructivism, uh, which is a position that says, uh, kind of similar to this English school idea, but going a little bit further, a little bit more radical, uh, positing that uh, not only will states' behavior change as they become more and more part of the club of international law, but their actual self-conception, their identity, will also shift, and including the citizens of the state will come to think about themselves, about their government, about their relationship with the world, with other countries, in a different way as they become more and more affected by international norms and structures, such as, say, the United Nations or other international uh, legal organizations. Right? That that integration actually changes the way we think about ourselves uh, and, and the world. Um, and finally, uh, and especially in recent international law scholarship, there's a set of views uh, that can be called uh, grouped under the umbrella of critical perspectives, which point out the ways in which uh, international legal norms tend to work to uh, affect these relationships of inequality, whether economic or political. Um, for instance, uh, exploitative economic practices, uh, taking all of the uh, resources out of a specific country, or loans uh, being provided from one country to another or from an international institution to a given country that are then very difficult to pay back, uh, and that these processes uh, are at the core of the international legal system itself. A related critique uh, is uh, associated with third world approaches to international law, which uh, tends to criticize the idea that international law itself has a Eurocentric bias, the idea that international legal norms and institutions work the best for the countries that were there at the beginning, and that latecomers tend not to be able to achieve the same degree of benefits from that system as the earlier members of the club. Um, and finally, there's uh, related critical views uh, that often are expressed in what we often call uh, law and studies that say that legal processes are really about economics. They're really about, say, culture or uh, even geography, territory, um, these sorts of factors. And these can be grouped under critical perspectives because they too uh, tend to focus on uh, the way that outside factors influence the law, right? So you can see major contrasts. So from some perspectives uh, in the scholarly community, uh, people are of the view that the legal system itself really can radically change the behavior of states. For others, that's not where the action is happening. It's all happening somewhere else, whether it's the state's own self-interest or whether it's these economic structures uh, or other geopolitical factors. OK, so with all of that in mind, um, we can start to look at China's uh, engagement with the international legal system. Um, and uh, we'll return to those different perspectives at the end to sort of try and weigh them against China's example. Um, but uh, from now on, we're going to basically be talking about uh, the specifics. Um, and so I'm just going to run very quickly through the early period uh, leading up to this sort of mid to late 19th century, which is where China's real uh, in-depth engagement with international law begins. Um, so this is uh, 
just to give you some of the earlier background to that. Um, China's earliest encounters with Western international law ideas, um, you could arguably date these back to the Ming Dynasty, uh, this 1554 agreement with Portugal in which Macau was leased to the Portuguese. Uh, this was, uh, from the Portuguese perspective, this is an international legal agreement. From the Ming Dynasty perspective, there's no real indication that they thought of it in those terms. Um, but nonetheless, uh, there is, uh, there's interesting research done about the way that this interaction occurred. It's probably safe to say that the, there was no real importation of international law thought into China at this point uh, from, uh, uh, from this interaction. Um, in the early 1600s, the most important relationship was actually with the Dutch, who were trying to force their way into the Chinese markets. Um, they were uh, competing with the Portuguese for access to all sorts of markets in Asia, and that included the biggest market of all, which was, of course, China. Um, and the Dutch uh, were excluded. They never actually managed to break into the Chinese market. They were treated as pirates often by the Ming Dynasty. Uh, and the Portuguese, of course, helped create that impression, um, describing the Dutch practices of sea warfare as being totally bandit-like and uh, not being within the pale of civilization. Um, it's not until late in the 1600s, uh, under uh, the Qing Emperor Kangxi, that uh, you get a real change in uh, China's approach to these relations with Western countries. Um, and uh, so you see Kanchi's Edict of 1684, which is a major turning point. Um, he says that the whole land is united now, all is at peace. The Manchu and the Han have joined into a single body. Right, Man Han Ren means Xiang Tong Yi And based on that one body that the state of China is now, after the Qing had taken over China, that it is now, again, unified and whole, um, he believes that it's time to open up for further trade and to show the glory and prosperity that is uh, bestowed by the new Qing dynasty to all, not only to Chinese themselves, but to all these foreigners coming to do trade as well. So this, uh, he, this is the first time that uh, the Qing now create this new policy of opening up further to foreign trade at, at set uh, ports. Um, in 1689, there's another kind of important episode, which is uh, the Sino-Russian Treaty of Nerchinsk. Um, this is actually a formal treaty. This is China's first real treaty with a Western power, its first international legal instrument that it signs on to in the modern uh, sense. And um, it's actually uh, negotiated by Jesuits on the Chinese side who had been attached to the Qing court. Um, it does a lot of the things that an international treaty uh, is supposed to do and is formally uh, very much a proper treaty. But again, there's no real sign that it leads to any change in the thought of the Qing court or of uh, Chinese uh, society more generally. There's no real importation of the idea that these sorts of international law practices are something worth doing more often. It's kind of a one-off with the Russian Empire uh, to sort of fix these border issues. Um, so just uh, running through a few more of these early kind of background encounters, um, in 1757, you have the Qing setting up the uh, Yiko Tongshan, or uh, Canton system, meaning that Canton, uh, Guangzhou, is going to be the only place where there's full uh, trade activities going on uh, with Western powers, that other ports will be blocked off. Um, and uh, just to give a little bit of a context, uh, at this point, the uh, British East India Company has been expanding, not only attempting to expand further in its Chinese trade, but also expanding throughout Asia. And uh, this is the same year as the Battle of Plassey, in which the British attain hegemony over Bengal, right, over the, mostly the area of modern-day Bangladesh. Um, and so the Qing were not entirely unaware of what was going on elsewhere in Asia. They were not deeply informed about the situation in India, but they were by this point, uh, and the records show, they were aware that the British had been expanding into the Indian subcontinent, that they were becoming a major force. So that just by itself is actually one factor that tends to get forgotten, uh, that the Qing uh, 
uh, were not thinking only in terms of China itself, but they were actually aware of uh, a decent amount of what was occurring at their borders. And this kind of contributed to some of their apprehension. Um, so under the reign of Qianlong, there were more measures that were instituted in order to limit access uh, for foreigners, including the five measures for countering the foreigners, uh, and uh, in 1793, uh, there was the uh, famed unsuccessful McCartney mission from Great Britain in which uh, a, uh, a British diplomat uh, sought access to the Qing, sought to establish normalized trade relations on a different basis from other European powers, and was basically politely but completely rejected um, because the Qing expressed uh, actually in, in a letter uh, to, to King George that the tiny far off island of England had nothing to offer the mighty Chinese empire and that the only access they would be given was kind of as a uh, sort of show of benevolence towards these seafaring crazy foreigners coming demanding to be let into the market. Um, that kind of sets the tone for the rest of the early uh, 1800s. Um, although, again, there is actually more happening beyond that kind of more classic story that's focused on the coasts. So if you look at the overland relationship, what's happening in India, Nepal, and Tibet, there's actually basically proxy wars already going on between the Qing and the British Empire, uh, with the British supporting the Nepalese in an attempted invasion of Tibet, the Qing also getting involved in the same conflict, and that kind of eventually resulting in a stalemate. But um, it's definitely uh, not quite the picture that's often told, which is that there is uh, the, the Qing were basically totally closed off and uninterested in the outside world. Uh, recent scholarship, uh, including a few uh, excellent books looking at this period, have uh, identified that the Qing were actually quite concerned about what was happening on their uh, borders with India and Nepal, um, and that they, to some extent, were viewing the relationship with Western states through that same lens. Okay, so now we get to the stuff that is traditionally seen as the turning point, and that's the real beginning for uh, the Ch mainland Chinese uh, state narrative of international law, which is uh, the first opium war, right? And that's often treated as the turning point. That is where the tables are turned, China becomes this kind of inferior party to the Western states coming in and demanding concessions, forcing unequal treaties uh, onto China, and uh, essentially using international law as a tool to advance Western interests. Um, and of course, to some extent, that is very much accurate. Um, but the idea that the first opium war is a turning point from the Chinese perspective of the time is actually not that well supported. Uh, to a large extent, there was continuity in the Chinese approaches through the First Opium War, uh, despite the fact that there had been this uh, major defeat. Uh, the basic court policies remained the same, except to the extent that they had to make a few concessions to, uh, to Britain. Um, one of the most uh, under-discussed uh, but uh, quite significant aspects of this First Opium War and the period leading up to it is uh, the role of Commissioner Lin Zixu, who is uh, famous as the minister who uh, was appointed to deal with the opium problem. He burned large amounts of opium. He destroyed uh, the British profits uh, that they were generating from that trade. And so that's seen often as being the spark of the opium war. Um, he actually had not sought to just impose Chinese policy uh, on the foreigners. He had also um, been very curious about the nature of the Western approach to international relations and the concept of international law. So Lin actually commissions the very first Chinese translation of an international law text, which is some key passages from uh, Emer de Vatel's Joie des Gens, the Law of Nations, uh, which has one of the most uh, significant of international law treatises. Um, and he translates sections dealing with the rights of states to limit their trade and to not allow foreigners access to their markets. Now, ironically, Vattel's treatise actually does say that states have the right to limit access to their markets, and it points to China as an example, right? So that kind of goes to show that at this period of time, 
Um, it wasn't actually quite this sort of narrative that I think it, we usually uh, tend, to, uh, tend to associate with it, where there was this total treatment of China as an outsider state, not part of the international system. The major international law writers and uh, treatises saw China as being actually, in some ways, an exemplary state, as having a lot to, uh, to recommend it, um, and many uh, good qualities. And even aside from their evaluation of China, they actually, regardless of what they thought about it, they treated it as a state that was part of the international system generating custom, customary international law, even if only in a few isolated areas, um, such as the right to limit access to your markets, right? So um, China was not the focus for Vattel or for most of these other uh, thinkers uh, on international law during this period, but um, there actually was uh, authority there to support the Chinese position that they had a right to limit access to their markets. Um, not that it convinced the British, who actually uh, innovated some new doctrines in order to justify the war over their in infringe upon interests uh, in the opium trade. Okay, so moving on, um, now we're actually getting into the point where changes start to really happen. Uh, the Second Opium War um, is where you first see issues of international relations and international law becoming the source for internal disputes within the Chinese system and among the Chinese court. Um, without going into the detailed background of the origins of the Second Opium War, uh, which um, is a little bit beyond the scope uh, for what we have time for today. Um, suffice it to say that in increased European uh, encroachments led to Chinese pushback on the local level. That sparked a conflict. And the, Euro the Western forces by this point were even more militarily superior uh, at the local level than they had been in the previous Opium War. And so they were able to threaten actually Beijing itself. Um, this uh, caused a lot of existential dread among a lot of Chinese officials. Um, but there was an argument about what should be the focus of the negotiations with the Western forces. Um, they were demanding a lot of things, including permanent normalized diplomatic relationships, uh, embassies stationed in Beijing that could call upon the emperor and visit him as an equal, because the diplomats would be representing the foreign monarch. So in other words, putting the British king or queen on the same level as the Chinese emperor, etc. Um, and that was what the emperor Xianfeng, who was reigning at the time, viewed as the most uh, unacceptable aspect of the Western demands. Not the demand to have access for trade, not the demand to be able to send warships patrolling up and down the coasts, uh, or even to territorial demands, but actually the demand for diplomatic uh, embassies stationed in Beijing with uh, ambassadors who could call upon the emperor, especially without performing the, the kato on the ground, uh, as had been the traditional practice. So Emperor Xianfeng gives orders to his negotiators, to Manchu officials, saying, you can basically agree to anything if it seems reasonable. You just need to avoid harming the form or structure or body of the state. You cannot shang guo ti being the body, literally the body of the state. Um, uh, what exactly that means is something that we'll continue to discuss. It's a very vague concept, but it was actually the core of debates over the Chinese relationship with Western powers during this specific period of time. Different interpretations of what it means to harm the guoti, this body of the state. Um, um, so there, uh, uh, again, among the other demands, there was remo removal of tariffs or setting lower fixed tariffs, uh, opening up more and more ports, uh, the demand for free navigation on the Yangtze River, and the diplomatic representation demand. Um, so Shenfeng, as we noted, he cared most about the diplomatic equality issue and his status as Chinese emperor being degraded. Um, his officials actually disagreed. So several officials, including his own brother, Prince Gong, actually expressed different views about what was the most important aspect of the guoti, of the body of the state that would be harmed by these Western demands. And so Prince Gong, uh, brother to the emperor, just a couple years his junior, 
um, issues a memor uh, memorial to the government saying there is no demand that is as critical as opening up the Yangtze River to allow foreign merchant ships and warships free access to the Chinese mainland. Um, so, of course, the Yangtze River, just for reference, um, as we know, is one of the two major rivers uh, that do uh, traditionally provided transportation and access throughout China, throughout southern China specifically. Um, and uh, of course, with Western steamships, by this point, you would have even more access coming in from the coast to visit essentially anywhere you wanted and indeed to send warships anywhere you might want to go uh, in the Chinese mainland. Um, I think it's important at this point to contextualize the Western demand, right? So this demand for freedom of navigation for all of these Western powers on the Yangtze River comes just a couple of years after the internationalization of the Danube River uh, in uh, Eastern Europe, Eastern and Central Europe, uh, via the Treaty of Paris following the Crimean War, right? And here again, there had been this decisive policy by Western states, Western European states, um, to ensure trade and military access to a huge body of land via the internationalization of this river. So actually a commission of the Danube is established, the first international organization ever created, technically, um, depending on your definition, but it's sometimes treated as, as being the first, is this Danube Commission that was intended to administer access to the river following Russia's loss of influence uh, after the Crimean War. And just a few years later, uh, the same thing would be done uh, in Africa with the Congo River. Uh, this uh, Congo River would be internationalized following the Berlin Conference of 1884-1885, right? And again, this allows trade access, it allows military uh, accessibility, allows you to send in punitive expeditions, allows you to take over wide swaths of land if you need to, or just to exert overwhelming force over locals who do not have lots of, you know, heavily armed gunboats uh, patrolling the rivers. Uh, and extending far into the continent. So you see these three situations, there's meaningful similarities in the demands on the Western side. And this suggests that Prince Gong, uh, who is pictured here when he was probably about two years old, the dating on this uh, Qing court painting is not exactly uh, 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 certain, but um, this is Emperor Xianfeng, a couple of years older. This is their father, Dao Guang, who had been emperor during the uh, the disastrous First Opium War, and this is Prince Gold. Uh, so you see that they are pictured as being the two favorites, the two closest to the emperor. Xian Feng is the closest of all. Prince Gong is a little bit further off, um, and Xian Feng is, of course, his, uh, his heir um, and the one who will be in office during the Second Opium War. So not that Prince Gong knew much about what was going on elsewhere in terms of these uh, European incursions into these rivers, but he was uh, very much concerned with an idea of the Guoti, of the Chinese state body, that was more territorial than that of his brother, the emperor, uh, who was concerned about ritual more than anything else. Um, Prince Gong uh, is eventually actually put in charge of the negotiations for peace. This comes as his brother, the emperor, has to flee Beijing as uh, the Western forces actually launch the assault on the city, burning down the Summer Palace. Uh, famously, and uh, uh, he and the other officials who are uh, in charge of negotiations alongside him, uh, under him, um, try to get some more favorable terms, but basically are unable to do so. Um, it doesn't help that Shen Feng comes up with another brilliant idea, which is that they should accept, uh, basically, try to, again, focusing on the diplomatic equality demand, try to get the Westerners to drop this demand for embassies by offering them zero tariff trade forever from now on. Um, so uh, if you're interested in the history of free market uh, ideas, uh, Xian Feng is not often mentioned, but this might actually be the first time that you have a ruler proactively saying we want to drop all of our tariffs and allow total uh, access to our markets. Um, and this is referred to in the documents as the Nei Ding Ban Fa, the internally determined approach. So this is really striking 
the Qing delegates disagree with this uh, so profoundly, apparently, and also are so aware that it's not going to do anything because the Westerners will not drop the demand for equal diplomatic representation that they actually never even mention this imperial order uh, to the foreign diplomats. Um, it's not even mentioned in the Western uh, historical records. Uh, and so you have this very first sort of uh, mini rebellion or at least uh, something like uh, a resistance to the imperial authority on the basis of these diplomatic encounters. All right. Um, so this is uh, Xianfeng, uh, sorry, this is Prince Gong being pictured two days after having to sign the convention, or a few, a, few, a few days rather, after being forced to sign the convention of Beijing of 1860, um, in which all of the main Western demands uh, were agreed to, including diplomatic representation, though the specifics of what that might mean would be hacked out in more detail later on. Um, as you can see, he's not happy, uh, or he's at the very least kind of pensive and brooding, worried about the national situation, seemingly. Um, this photo was taken by the Italian photographer Felice Beato, who uh, was uh, with the British forces during the Second Opium War and produced the first kind of high quality photographic images of China um, ever. Uh, and he actually was able to take a photo of Prince Gong uh, at that point. Um, so shortly after this, uh, again, disastrous defeat, acceding to the Western demands, uh, Prince Gong uh, sends another memorial to the emperor demanding or requesting the creation of a new foreign office, China's first dedicated foreign office in something like a Western sense, um, which the emperor agrees to quickly, but then gives it the title, the office in charge of affairs relating to commerce with the various nations. And so Prince Gong has to submit another memorial asking to drop the word commerce because the emperor still doesn't get it that this is not just about trade, there's this whole other world of diplomatic exchanges, of other issues that have to be dealt with in relations with foreign countries. Uh, military matters, other diplomatic matters, and not least, international legal uh, treaties and other such uh, matters. So he very politely says, can we drop the word commerce? Because then they'll think we're still only interested in trading with them once in a while, but not actually having diplomatic relations. And the emperor at least agrees to that. Um, so under somewhat murky circumstances, Emperor Xianfeng, who had presided over this massive defeat, uh, dies very shortly afterwards, later the same year, 1861. Um, he then uh, is, uh, he has his uh, kind of conservative Manchu officials that he had put in charge uh, after his death in his will, but they are overthrown by a coup launched by both Prince Gong as well as uh, the two empresses, uh, including uh, Cixi, who will famously become this major figure throughout the rest of uh, 19th century uh, Chinese history, um, and uh, who would serve as the kind of power behind the throne over the next two emperors. Um, so Prince Gong uh, is in charge of the new, what's called the Zongli Yaman, which is the, uh, this foreign office. Um, they also, under his administration, found a school of combined learning, or translator's college, as it was sometimes uh, called uh, Tong Wenguan, which is responsible for training translators and for just expanding knowledge of the West and Western practices in general. Um, and so here, two years uh, after the founding of the Zongli Yama, you get the first full translation of a Western international legal work. Um, this is uh, Henry Wheaton's Elements of International Law, which was a book by an American diplomat and international law scholar that was much in use uh, in Europe as well during this, this period of time. It was one of the most up-to-date treatises, um, and it's translated by an American missionary who would spend his life uh, as an educator in China, uh, William A.P. Martin. Um, and this uh, first translation of uh, a Western international law text in full introduces some key terms such as sovereignty, uh, 主权, 
and, uh, and, and various other key terms relating to treaties, uh, relating to international responsibility, et cetera, into the Chinese language. Uh, so that the book is translated as Wang Guo Gong Fa. Um, and uh, the Vatel translation that had been created by Lin Zixu in the first Opium War is actually not entirely forgotten by this point. It's included as part of uh, a book called Hai Guo Tu Zhi, which was the kind of a record of the Western states um, that was not quite given this, the same level of importance as the translations coming out of the Tonglanguan. So by this point, you, at, you start to have multiple sources of information on international law. Um, the Qing, under the Zhongli Yaman era, actually starts sending permanent diplomatic missions abroad, as well as roving ambassadors who will make circuits of various countries in Europe, South America, and elsewhere. So you do first start to get these regular, uh, normalized diplomatic relations. They're not quite treated as uh, relations between equals in the sense that Western states uh, demand and assume, but the Qing have uh, a sort of lucky break in that Emperor Xianfeng is dead because the emperor during this period of time is very young, he's a minor, so there's no real need for the Western uh, diplomats to meet him on a regular basis, so they can postpone this question of the kato of this prostration uh, ceremony until well into the 1870s when China's feeling a little bit less vulnerable. Um, and they do eventually give in and say that the kato is not required. Um, though it takes a while, and more internal debate over this guoti, this body of the state idea, that Western disrespect for the figure of the emperor is what really harms the body of the state. So there's still people advocating this point of view. Okay, so um, we're kind of skipping over the most of the late 1900, uh, 1800s uh, and uh, moving on to what can be seen as another major turning point, which is China's participation in the Hague conferences. Um, so in the first Hague conference of 1899, which is where leading uh, European and uh, American states uh, uh, join together to draft rules for the law of warfare, for laws regulating disputes between countries, etc. cetera. Um, it's convened by the Russian Tsar, but uh, it's basically a kind of pan-European, pan-Western effort. China and Japan are both invited um, but uh, China is effectively excluded from real meaningful participation in these proceedings. Um, so the Qing delegation includes uh, the head of the delegation, Yang Ru, who is a kind of very traditional official in terms of where he came from. He had worked on military matters, on other kind of uh, other significant posts uh, before being transferred into being stationed as a diplomat. Um, he doesn't have extensive knowledge of international law or of foreign languages, etc. He's kind of a, an establishment uh, figure for the Manchu court, but he is aided by uh, two others, Hu Weida and Lu Zhengxiang. Lu Zhengxiang, who will be one of the leading diplomats uh, in the following decades, um, and who uh, actually comes up through the Tongwenguan, through that translator's college, and has learned Russian and French both fluently serving as translator for the, Russian mis uh, for the Chinese mission in St. Petersburg before being sent to The Hague together with this delegation. Um, and you have here also in this photo uh, from the Dutch Peace Palace Library, uh, Yang Ru's uh, wife. Uh, of course, you don't often get photos of the families of leading officials, uh, especially abroad during this period of time, so it's really amazing that they did preserve this, um, as well as uh, his children who also accompanied Yang Ru on this mission to The Hague. So China during this period of time was actually uh, in a pretty bad situation yet again. There had been a brief period of hope and also kind of optimism from Western states that China, or pessimism depending on your perspective, that China was getting more powerful in the 1870s and 80s. But by the 1890s and especially by the end of the decade, Japan was making all of the positive headlines. It was seen as being the real modernizing force in East Asia and as the real kind of equal of Western powers. China was seen as not having done enough to reform itself. It didn't help that there was a major reform effort in 1898 that failed uh, and where the leading reformist officials were actually, uh, some of them, 
executed, others went into exile. Um, but China was, during this period of time, along with the Ottoman Empire, along with uh, a few other states, uh, referred to uh, often in, in international law textbooks as a half-civilized state. In other words, uh, being not a full member of the community of nations. And this was terminology that actually had not been used even during the Second Opium War. This was a new development, right? So we tend to think that all of the bad stuff is kind of like from these old prejudices and then it gradually dies out over time. It was actually really about finding a category in which to put China that would allow more uh, extreme demands and more Western uh, influence in, in order to get trade access, territory, et cetera, you know, the, the usual demands. Um, and the same was happening in the Ottoman Empire of the same period. Um, so uh, the Qing delegation at the Hague Conference is not uh, treated especially uh, seriously. Um, they're kind of politely, you know, invited to all of the events. But in the actual diplomatic records behind the scenes, you can see the diplomats making jokes, saying that uh, that uh, Yang Ru had just asked the officials next to him to pull his braid one way or the other as to whether he should nod or shake his head to say yes or no during the conference. Right? These sorts of very uh, you know offensive comments. Um, and in general, the Western diplomats spent a lot of time contrasting Japan, which had by this point been really seriously modernizing with China, which uh, was uh, representing the opposite. Um, although China was actually in the process of you know, continuing to attempt to reform key aspects of its policies, but it was certainly doing so more slowly than Japan. Um, nonetheless, this is actually not the whole story. So actually, when you go back into the diplomatic memoranda, the memorials that are submitted by the Qing delegation to the court, they're actually talking about the proposals being made at the Hague Conference in a lot of detail and uh, giving uh, well-considered uh, opinions about the merits of these various proposals. So things such as establishing a mandatory arbitration agreement uh, that when states have disputes, they should be required to arbitrate them or there should be some sort of uh, 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 responsibility to do so before turning to force. The Zongli Yaman actually specifically comments on this, and it points out um, that there are possible negative uh, drawbacks for China because while it's intended as a means for reducing conflict and easing disputes, it can also be imagined that all of the foreign countries will yet again, as they did during the previous wars, band together. They will treat China as an outlaw, and they will say, you're in violation of your uh, duties under this arbitration agreement, which is being staffed by our arbitrators, and that you will then be subject to even more harsh treatment than you would if you had just stayed out of this entirely in the first place. So the Chinese uh, diplomats and the uh, foreign policy officials are keenly aware of some of these liabilities, and they are thinking through these things in some detail. Um, Yang Ru actually suggests that the court should sign the Red Cross Treaty and the uh, agreement on the Permanent Court of Arbitration um, that we were just uh, mentioning. Um, and he does so because, in his words, this is the first time China has joined a conference like this. If we don't sign and ratify, then the foreigners will suspect that China will remain an isolated region, and in the future public conferences, whenever they might be held, they won't be willing to invite us or associate with us. Um, nonetheless, he suggests that some of the specific rules, such as on land war, on uh, naval warfare, might, not, might be premature at the moment because China's armed forces are just not modernized enough to follow all of the new rules that are emerging in the Geneva Conventions and in these new uh, Hague Conventions. Um, and so there should be a period of waiting for several years before signing on to them as the military forces are given new training and modernized. Uh, that's only Yaman response to this. Everyone around the world considers this new treaty on rules for naval warfare as a great benevolent act. Shan Ju is the term that is used. And it's uh, difficult to be the lone dissenter in this sort of a situation. It would be better to show charity to our fellow men, display a willingness to put our moral, moral virtue into practice. Um, but nonetheless, the land warfare treaty could result in China, again, being treated as an outlaw if some conflict emerges and there's a violation of one of the rules that are stipulated. Um, and you have Yang Ru's comment as well. The situation of powers around the globe at the moment, 1899, is just the same as the spring and autumn era. Uh, 
We've been engaged in diplomacy for the past several decades, but have had nothing to do with these great conferences in Europe and America. So this is truly a great turning point for our contemporary foreign relations. So uh, ironically, perhaps tragically, before China has a chance to even fully sign on to and ratify the Hague Conventions, the Boxer Uprising occurs with some support from conservative figures in the Qing court. Um, and this is responded to in just the way that the Qing diplomats had feared, as China proving itself to be an outlaw, as proving that it is not willing to abide by these rules of civilized states. Uh, this is the uprising in which uh, local groups opposing foreign presence, especially foreign missionaries, had killed uh, missionaries and uh, some diplomats, uh, as well as other foreigners present in northern China, as well as opposing local officials they viewed as collaborators. Um, so there's this eight nation intervention, these western states come in, and actually war is never declared despite the fact that there's eight countries uh, you know, invading the Chinese mainland and occupying key parts of China, uh, including parts of, uh, including Beijing, including other uh, centers of Qing rule. Um, and so this satirical uh, cartoon from the same period uh, is uh, kind of representing this uh, with the US being the main objector against a formal declaration of war. Um, actually, in the case of the US, because they wanted to ensure that there was no territorial uh, grabs done by the other powers, that large swaths of Chinese land were not handed over to, uh, to France or to the UK expanding its presence, or to Germany, which had since the last few years before this, been keenly pursuing uh, territories in Asia. Um, following the uh, very, very one-sided conflict, uh, there's actually the first ever international criminal tribunal. It's uh, against some mid-level Qing officials who are seen as having supported the Boxer Uprising. And uh, there are uh, execution sentences. Uh, there's people who are also given lighter sentences. but um, this is uh, kind of a forgotten precedent for later international criminal law, but it uh, is significant, I think, especially in that it occurs in this very kind of semi-colonial context in which China is treated as being this state that's on the margins, maybe an outlaw that should be treated you know, as, uh, as being capable of being punished however you like, and maybe a potential member that needs to be kind of coaxed in to the international legal community. And of course, there's a lot of hypocrisy with that as well in terms of what China can possibly do at this period of time to become a member of the club and be treated uh, on a condition of equality. So these Western activities uh, were actually being criticized at the time. You know, this is another cartoon. This is from a satirical magazine in, based in Berlin called Uk. Uh, and it uh, depicts the European spider uh, as uh, putting her paw right in the middle of China as also in the African sand and spinning her webs everywhere. You can see that the paws of the spider, or the legs of the spider, are railway tracks. And of course, this is a period of time in which uh, rail was being built throughout European colonial possessions, also especially in Northeast China, in Manchuria, um, where the Russian railway activities were used as a pretext for ever more Russian presence. That would get taken over by Japan uh, as, as the years went by over the following decade. Um, so this, there's a letter from Yang Ru, uh, Yang Ru uh, or Yang Yu, as it was written in Western sources of the time, um, which uh, is in response to this boxer uprising. He actually sends it to somebody who he had met during the Hague Conference, which was the uh, first female Nobel laureate and major peace activist, Bertha von Suttner. Uh, Bertha von Zutner was uh, one of the kind of guiding idealists who was promoting the peace movement and this, this Hague international law uh, codification movement to try and reduce warfare, introduce more humanitarian rules for war. And she had met Yang Ru during the conference and commented favorably on him and, and the Qing delegation um, as well. And uh, Yang Ru's letter uh, is uh, written in French and published in newspapers of the time, and he says that the major cause of the present conflicts in China is this European sense that all of China has to become Christianized 
before it can actually become a member of the community of states. The Chinese don't want to convert to Christianity any more than the Europeans would want to embrace the maxims of Confucius. And he recommends that diplomacy and trade be separated out from this question of the presence of missionaries and the protection of figures of missionaries uh, uh, and uh, Western states being able to intervene to protect these people who are traveling throughout the land, trying to proselytize uh, their religious beliefs. Um, he also makes favorable comments on Bertha von Suttner and uh, her other peace activists' mission to try and uh, end the horrors of warfare. And basically it goes to show that um, this uh, kind of opinion among the elite Western diplomats that the Qing delegates were just sitting there asking their aides to pull their braids back and forth and not thinking about what was going on was just, you know, totally ridiculously inaccurate. Uh, however, there was not interest among these elites uh, of these, you know, colonial empires in finding out what the Chinese actually thought about uh, these international legal processes as they were occurring. <laughs> Um, this does start to change a little bit. Uh, so by the Second Hague Conference in 1907, uh, this time it is led by Lu Zhengxiang, who, as mentioned, uh, was fluent in Russian and uh, French. He also spoke a few other languages. He had a pretty extensive training in diplomacy. He had been kind of the point person for a lot of the diplomatic incidents that had occurred over the previous decade in Europe. Um, he leads this second Chinese delegation to the Second Hague Conference in 1907, and uh, he notes that we must attend these sorts of conferences in order to influence the rules of diplomacy and war that affect our own interests. So there are still people in the court during this time that are skeptical of the value of even participating in the international law system, including these conferences setting new rules. But uh, Lu Zhengxiang uh, argues very forcefully that it is important. Um, so uh, a couple of uh, minor, uh, actually major from the Chinese perspective, but minor from the kind of uh, received memory of this conference uh, incidents. One involves the third class power dispute. So this was a, uh, related to the creation of this new international court, a prize court that was going to be the first permanent international court um, for collecting uh, prizes in naval warfare, which refers to when one ship captures another ship. You have to decide whether it was fair or whether it violated the rules of naval warfare. Um, the uh, Chinese and the, all of the other delegations, by this point, the South Americans had also come in large numbers to this conference. They agreed that this was a good idea, but they objected very forcefully to the plan for the actual court, which created multiple, four actually different, uh, or five actually different groups uh, in which uh, states would be ranked in terms of the amount of time they could send judges to sit on the court. And China was put in the third class power status uh, based on its naval power at the time. Um, whereas the eight kind of great powers uh, of the time were put in the first uh, category with the longest period of time sitting on the court. Um, so uh, not just China, but also uh, several South American states, especially Brazil, who uh, were also put into these lower categories based on their lack of a strong navy, were uh, made lar very vocal protests at this plan during the Second Hague Conference. Um, there were some other disputes, uh, some of which were sort of interesting in light of China's experiences before this and after this. Um, so one of the delegates, uh, Colonel Ping, uh, at one point during a meeting said, the Western forces have invaded us several times without actually officially declaring war. At this meeting, maybe we could actually develop a specific, clear definition of what war means. And this is responded to still at this point by the Western diplomats laughing because they decided to just treat it as a joke. So this very serious uh, intervention from China's perspective this is actually a project in international law that would later get picked up in the 1970s, right? About almost 70 years later of defining what exactly war means in international law. It's raised by a Chinese delegate to the conference and it's just greeted by a big round of laughter in the room. Um, one of the diplomats in, in one of his memoirs says uh, that it was uncomfortable laughter because they were aware what was motivating that intervention, that it was China's sense that 
it was subject to invasion at any time. Um, so other kind of relevant commentary from this period. Uh, so Lu Zhengxiang, the leader of the delegation, sang in his, one of his memorials to the Qing court, the Brazilian delegate to this meeting said at one point, now I realize there's no just principle under heaven. After this meeting ends, I can only return home and implore my countrymen to commit themselves to pursuing military power. Please wait until the third Hague conference, gentlemen, and see whether Brazil is a strong country or a weak one, a large country or a small one. And um, this is a little bit, not, a, I guess, a direct word-for-word -word translation of what uh, the Brazilian delegate said, but that delegate, uh, Rui Barbosa, had made these sorts of comments during the conference, and Lou is saying the same thing to the court, basically telling them, we can't rely on being treated as equal members of this club just based on our willingness to participate. We need to become militarily powerful in order to be treated as equals in this system, like the Japanese are already doing by this point uh, very effectively. Um, so this is greeted by the second example of a major act of resistance by diplomats based on their foreign policy encounters against the Qing court. There is this unprecedented uh, joint protest memorial uh, submission sent by the Qing diplomats stationed in Europe calling on the Qing court to greatly speed up its reform of the Chinese legal system and the Chinese state because that's the only way that China will not, in the future, be treated as one of these third-class states, or maybe even put into a lower ranking. Um, and uh, basically, this is a very harsh criticism that they're making, uh, signed by you know uh, half a dozen diplomats, sending a joint uh, submission to the court, um, and saying, if you do not quickly reform the state, we don't know what kind of treatment we will get at the Third Hague Conference. So the Third Hague Conference is probably the most important international meeting that never happened. Um, it was interrupted by World War I. But the Chinese, from the period of 1907 on, were thinking in terms of the importance of this next conference, trying to raise the status of the, of the government and of the state in the eyes of their peers uh, in the West. Uh, and the Chink do, does actually, in response to this, they, they do speed up the process of reform. That's interrupted by the Xinhai Revolution in 1911, the end of the Qing Dynasty. Um, and uh, at the same time, Japan becomes ever more uh, invasive in its approach to trying to secure concessions in China. Um, just as a side note, uh, Yuan Shikai, who was uh, the first real uh, president of the Republic of China, who had been a high, the highest level Qing official, uh, in charge of the most important region of China, the Chirli region uh, in the Northeast. Um, and uh, his support for the Xinhai Revolution, when he saw that it was in his own interests, was a major factor in allowing it to come to a close and allowing the Qing Dynasty to be abolished. Um, he actually uh, is uh, very much uh, in favor of, of engagement with international law. And even he, who's usually seen as this kind of very backwards looking figure, he was, of course, in many respects, uh, very conservative, wanting to restore the empire with him as the emperor. Um, nonetheless, uh, he also uh, makes uh, quite a few comments about the importance of maintaining China's international legal ties. So you can see by this point, even the kind of arch conservatives are aware that the times have changed, right? That international law is not something China can ever do away with entirely ever again. Um, Yuan Shikai is also uh, very concerned with what he calls resolving the guoti problem, that same term that we remember from before, the question of what is the body of the state? How should it be defined? For Yuan Shikai, uh, this is his argument for restoring an empire similar to that of uh, Meiji Japan of the same period because the Chinese demand uh, a, a guoti, a state body that is that of an empire, not of a republic. That's his argument. Of course, in practice, that proves to be incorrect as he's overthrown. Uh, but you can see he says uh, in, his, in the introduction to a book on treaty law of 1905, Yuan says, public lawyers say that all state law must be made by legislators. However, among states, none can usurp this legislative power. Thus, nothing is more important in international law than treaties. These sorts of comments, right? Demonstrating some familiarity with international law, by this point, 
is part of Chinese officials' own sign uh, to each other and to the society that they are with the times, that they're not uh, these kind of backwards figures like Xianfeng had been during the Second Opium War. Um, okay, so kind of carrying through uh, to a few more of these important uh, examples. Um, at the Versailles, uh, uh, when uh, the Treaty of Versailles is being uh, negotiated, China ends up not signing because of the uh, refusal of uh, Japan, especially, but also of the other Western states to put a resolution of what's called the Shandong Question into the Treaty of Versailles, meaning the German territory that had been seized in Shandong, which was then given to Japan during World War I, because Japan was on the side of the Allies, rather than given back to China, uh, should be restored to China. And this demand is what leads uh, the Chinese delegation to uh, protest the Treaty of Versailles, to refuse to sign, and is only later on that um, they will uh, be willing to uh, enter into this uh, new system, the League of Nations, which is founded at the same time uh, because of the importance they put on this issue of territory. So Lu Zhengxiang, who is again the leader of one of the delegations, China's in the middle of a civil war at this point, so Lu is leading the official state delegation from the Beijing government. There's also the Guomindang uh, Nationalist Party government, um, which uh, is based in the South. They send their own delegation. And both sides refuse to sign the treaty. Um, both are also getting death threats. They're getting uh, uh, angry letters. They're getting mobs and angry crowds kind of denouncing them for even daring to think about signing a treaty that doesn't give China's territory in Shandong back. But after refusing to sign, when they return to China, they are met by some cheering crowds that applaud this decision. Um, okay, so uh, the rest of China's international legal experience before uh, 1949 is largely dominated by the League of Nations and by this new attempt at setting up an international system that is more legally regulated, more fair and inclusive to some degree than had been the situation before World War I. However, there's key aspects of this new system that still are seen by the Chinese as totally unacceptable and as causing it to have major uh, damage to its interests or to perhaps the body of the state. One is this article of the League of Nations Covenant that says none, none of these rules that we're deciding at this uh, conference will change the validity of regional understandings uh, such as uh, the Monroe Doctrine for securing the maintenance of peace. The Monroe Doctrine being the U.S. claim to kind of dominance over the Western Hemisphere, over Latin America, and to be the protector of Latin American states, to be able to exclude foreign interference. Japan is making the same sort of claims in East Asia by this point, and very explicitly. Um, and China is, uh, Chinese uh, diplomats are very aware of this, and on this basis, they try to get this article changed because it could be taken by the Japanese as an argument for setting up this huge sphere of influence throughout East Asia. So the diplomat Wang Chonghui says there should, uh, if there are regional understandings that con are contrary to the letter or the spirit of the covenant, those should not be valid. That is not ultimately adopted. Um, the, that provision is not revised. Um, and uh, they also try to add other additional specific rules, such as that engagements or understandings should not prejudice the rights or interests of members of the League that are not parties to those specific agreements, um, which is uh, a rule of general international law, general principles of international law, sometimes called the Pacta Tertis Principle. Third parties to an agreement should not uh, be either harmed or benefited by that agreement. It's a kind of general rule of international uh, legal and treaty interpretation. Um, they, uh, the Chinese delegates actually are very familiar with the lexicon of international law by this point. They're trying to add these specific rules uh, into the international organization that's being created, again, unsuccessfully. Um, and a sign of uh, this kind of continued sort of real politique, kind of geopolitics operating alongside the international law uh, debates that are occurring is that China's Shandong question is not resolved at Versailles at all. 
it's only brought up via the Washington Naval Conference of 1921, which uh, the U.S. Secretary of State of the time calls a Magna Carta for China because it will uh, set up the rules for East Asia going forward, how China will be gradually brought into its higher, uh, into uh, more close similarity with Western civilization. Um, he says uh, that uh, China has this fine ancient civilization that just sadly is not enough to make it strong enough to compete with Western powers or Japan. Uh, and so it needs to be kind of guided into modernity, right? And this is this kind of U.S. Secretary of State saying this. Um, Shandong is actually restored to China at this time. So this is the U.S. Secretary of State, uh, Charles Evans Hughes. Actually behind him is the Chinese representative, literally like over his shoulder. The U.S. acts as China's protector during this conference, saying we will get the Japanese to give you back Shandong, but in return there's specific rules that we want you to adhere to in the East Asian region. And this is a kind of dynamic that will continue throughout this period before 1949. Um, okay, just a couple other very brief specific examples to bring up. Um, another aspect of the league system that uh, was very important to China during this period, the uh, Article 19 of the League Covenant, this allowed the Assembly of the League of Nations to provide advice uh, on uh, reconsidering specific treaties that might have become inapplicable uh, under changed international conditions. Of course, for China, this is especially relevant for the unequal treaties, for all of those treaties, including the ones signed during the Opium Wars, as well as several others with other European powers relating to lost territorial administration rights, loss of autonomy over tariffs, etc. Um, in practice, uh, China is never able to successfully invoke it except to a certain extent in relation to Belgium. Um, and there it's not directly conducted via this mechanism, but, uh, but uh, its other attempts uh, essentially fail, and the Western states are still not willing to allow China to use what's now in the actual legal text themselves to try and adopt this legal path to regaining its lost status. Um, so the U.S. sponsors, along with other Western states, but with the U.S. in the lead, sponsors the creation of a commission on extraterritoriality in China. However, this issues a report in 1926 that doesn't say anything more than that extraterritoriality should be abolished eventually, but China is not yet ready to do so. So, and of course, this is very much alienating China uh, during this period of time when it's actually showing a great deal of willingness to be included in this League of Nations system. Um, the one major success that China has uh, before the disaster of the Sino-Japanese, Second Sino-Japanese War breaks out is this Belgium-China case of 1926. And this is where Belgium, which had signed a treaty in 1865 that said uh, it had exclusive control over tariffs, customs, extraterritorial jurisdiction, most favored nation status, and that only Belgium could modify the agreement, that China did not have a right to modify the agreement. Um, China refuses to renew the treaty when it comes due for renewal, and Belgium opposes this. It tries to file a case before the Permanent Court of International Justice, which had been created under the League system. Um, uh, China refuses to allow a case to be filed, so there's no compromis, there's no joint declaration stating the facts of the case to the PCIJ. Um, and China basically waits it out successfully, um, even though the PCIJ does issue a few orders, uh, in the end it becomes clear to Belgium not only that the court is unlikely to give it quite the successful judgment that it wants, but also that its other Western neighbors are not interested in getting China angry to defend the rights of tiny Belgium. And so here China finally has a success via legal means of ending uh, the validity of one of the unequal treaties, and they're able to introduce uh, 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 stipulations like the nationals of the two high contracting parties will be subject, each in the territory of the other party, to the laws and jurisdiction of the law courts of the other party. So in other words, non-extraterritoriality, if you're in their territory, you are under their territorial court's administration. Um, but China fails to uh, repeat this with other major powers, uh, such as the U.S. or U.K., which retain their extraterritorial rights. 
until the middle of the 1940s, right? Almost at the very end of World War II. Um, this is the, so China was still under the uh, Beiyang Northern Government with its five color flag during the first part of this case and under the Guomindang uh, by the time it was resolved, uh, which is the reason for those two flags. Okay, so just to wrap up, um, this is referring to another example uh, of Italy's uh, arguments relating to Ethiopia. Japan and Italy started to make very similar arguments about why they should be allowed to create these zones of regional hegemony. For Italy, it's Ethiopia, which they say has failed to become a full member of the community of civilized states. Japan says the same about China. Actually, Japan says, given all that there had been the civil war, China just doesn't have a government, and so they need foreign intervention to provide it with one. Um, the fact that uh, there, these arguments were still being made led lots of Chinese intellectuals to criticize the League uh, from various different factions and different ideological perspectives. So there were extreme leftists and extreme rightists, both who uh, argued that the League should be abandoned, that China should go its own way, try to set up its own system, and stop being pushed around in uh, this League of Nations system. So Tang Liangli, who was one of the intellectuals of the period, actually, by the end of the 1930s, ends up as arguing on behalf of the Japanese that at least the Japanese great space in Asia would be something between Asians, and there would be clear rules, at least, where you knew who was in charge, but it wouldn't be the situation with the League of Nations, where it seems equal, but then in practice, China's unable to uh, achieve full equality. Right? That's, of course, one of the most extreme views that anybody articulated, um, but there, were, there was a, a group that, that did hold that view. More common were views like those of Zhou Enlai, who said the Western states uh, are not serious about treating us as equals under the League of Nations system, but we have one big possible friend, which is the Soviet Union, who is also an outsider, who's also treated as being not quite part of the system, but not quite entirely outside of it, as marginal and who, like us, who has already given up their colonial claims in some parts of our territory, and so they and we can form a new socialist world order. Um, there were also those who advocated ties, close ties with Germany during the same period of time, including Chiang Kai-shek himself, who was a major uh, fan of this idea of close Sino-German cooperation, uh, even during the Nazi period. And then you had China's elite diplomat internationalists who still believed, maybe not in the League itself, but in something like the League system. Uh, and these individuals, uh, such as Wellington Ku, Wang Chonghui, uh, they argued uh, for turning the League into something better, which would be more legally binding, have more formal equality, and would not have these same sorts of manipulable rules that could be used to take away China's interests by being reinterpreted uh, by more powerful states. Um, so, okay, just to wrap up, uh, the uh, five principles of coexistence that pe the People's Republic of China uh, advances alongside India in 1954 can be seen in light of its preceding experience as reflecting a few very consistent concerns, right? These five principles uh, include mutual respect between states for each other's integrity and sovereignty, mutual non-interference in each other's affairs, equal and mutual benefits, uh, beneficial working relations, mutual non-aggression, peaceful coexistence. So I just recently heard somebody give a talk about the five uh, principles of peaceful coexistence that said it's basically, it doesn't add anything new, it's just like a gloss on the UN Charter which already says aggression is banned, that states should not be allowed to commit aggression against each other, they shouldn't be allowed to intervene in each other's affairs. Um, but I think you can see in the fact that China does make that at the centerpiece of its foreign relations going forward that there is a, a set of consistent uh, concerns. One is clarity. So China, after that initial period of resistance, actually becomes an advocate for more clear and specific international rules because, as we saw at those various conferences, there's real concern that any loophole or any ambiguity can be used, uh, taken advantage of by more powerful states to take advantage of China or to justify continued unequal relationships. So even today, you see the People's Republic of China not being interested in vague and ambiguous, arguably ambiguous, legal standards, including use kogens, 
uh, which is a doctrine related to certain highest level values of international law, including in human rights, as well as really broad norms of customary international law that are defined somewhat vaguely. China tends to not like vague rules, and that is consistent uh, for a very long time. Um, the concern with the Guoti issue, with China's territory, with being able to define China's space in which it is secure and not subject to interference, is very consistent from Prince Gong onward, uh, as well as the idea that engagement can be a source of internal resistance, perhaps, or maybe a, to some extent reform. Um, this is something you will see again in the late 1970s when China enters, the People's Republic of China enters the UN system, takes up its space there. You see it again in the late 1990s as China is entering the WTO, and there's uh, human rights are written into the Chinese PRC constitution, the criminal law is majorly revised and uh, adapted to be more reflective of international standards. So in these three respects, um, I think you can see uh, some major consistent factors uh, with regards to China's current concerns with relation to international law. And they're very much, uh, arguably, I would argue, they're based on this previous history of its international legal engagements. Okay, I'll wrap it up there. Thank you.